All right, welcome back to Code Realm. It's been a really long time since I made any content, but I really wanted to go back and sort of revisit the two authentication videos I made in the past, specifically the one titled Authentication on the Web and also Session Authentication in Express. And I think what really prompted me to go back to this topic is the article I've read titled Your Node.js Authentication Tutorial is Probably Wrong. Now, this publication really goes into some of the detail and some of the complexities involved in rolling out your own authentication module. So everything from storing your password securely to creating password reset tokens to API tokens to things like rate limiting and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different places where things can go wrong and I thought it could be kind of interesting to cover those different features in this tutorial series. So what I want to do in this series and this one is going to be about authentication in Node.js specifically. So the way I want us to approach this is to look at this in terms of the features that we want to build. So the three main ones you're going to develop are login, logout, and register functionality. These are kind of like the bread and butter of any authentication module. And you're probably also going to impose a session expiry because your sessions are going to have a limited lifetime so you want to make sure that they have an auto expiry after a certain time period you're going to also want to make sure to have a, an email verification so this is simply allowing the user to confirm their email address once they register with the application you probably also want to have a password reset functionality and this is to allow users to recover their password in case they forgot it the next one you may want to consider is password confirmation and this is when you prompt the user to re-enter their password on a restricted area of the website so for example when they try to modify credit card information or when they want to edit the order they made with the website. The next one would be persistent login and you may know this one as a remember me feature if you've seen checkboxes on some of the websites you visit. There could be an option to keep you logged in on the website for a prolonged period of time. We're going to then look into account lockout. So this is disabling user account in case they made too many failed login attempts. And the last one we'll look into is rate limiting. Now this one is essentially throwing a status of 429 when the user has made too many requests to the server. Now I thought before we actually start building the application it could be useful to look into some of the theory behind authentication. And as you probably know, authentication in and of itself is essentially verifying user identity. And in the process of doing so, typically a user will provide two pieces of information. So there's going to be a public piece of information, typically an email address and or a username. And there's going to be a piece of private information. So most of the time, this is going to be a password. In some cases, this is going to be an API token. Or in the case of two-factor authentication, this could also be a one-time passcode. Now related to authentication is also session management. Once again, all of these concepts are kind of related to the video I've made in the past. This one is titled Authentication on the Web, Sessions, Cookies, JDBT, Local Storage, and more. So I encourage you to go back and revisit that one as well. But back to this presentation. So when it comes to authentication, typically on the servers, we're going to be looking into what's known as session management. Now, as you may know, HTTP is a stateless protocol. So that is to say that every request that you make to the server is going to be self-contained and isolated. And now to be able to store user information between requests, we're going to need to store sessions on the server. So sessions are effectively used to retain user information between those different requests that they make. And if we want to tie back an existing session back to the user, we're going to ask the user to provide a session cookie. So a session cookie essentially ties back a given request to the user's session that is stored service side. So in the context of sessions, you're probably going to encounter a concept of session timeout. And this is because we want to impose a session lifetime on every session that is being made on the server. The most common one is going to be known as idle timeout. And this one has a sliding expiration. Essentially, this is going to be either half an hour or two hours, depending on the application this is a period of time when the session can be inactive. So for example, if the application imposes a half an hour idle timeout, that means that you can be inactive in the application for half an hour. And then after that, the session is going to auto expire. A lot of the times this idle timeout is going to be reset on every request you make to the server. So this way you're going to be able to extend the session into the future. Now a question comes up, what if you continue to make requests to the server indefinitely? Will this keep the session active infinitely? Well, this is where the absolute timeout comes in. And the absolute timeout compared to the idle timeout, the difference is that it has a fixed expiration, meaning that we're imposing a maximum duration of lifetime on the session. So even though you might still be active on the website, we want to make sure that you're being kicked out after a fixed period of time. So for example, this could be six hours, it could be a day. And then the last concept we're going to look into is renewal timeout. So this is the interval of time until the session ID is regenerated. Because in some cases, we want to update the session ID to prevent certain attacks, such as session hijacking. Effectively, what this does is periodically, the server is going to regenerate the session ID and send that new session cookie back to the user. All right, so that's basically it for the introduction. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to open up my terminal and I'm going to switch to my workspace called Realm. Let's make a new directory. We're going to call this one node auth and I'm going to switch into it. All right, so what we're going to do is 
is we're going to npm init a new project and we're going to create another directory. I'm going to call this one API. We might also make a directory called web. So this one will be for the front end. As far as the back end, we're going to keep this one in the API folder for now. But let's switch to API and let's do the same thing. I'm going to do npm init dash y. And since we're going to be using Node.js, we're going to install Express. So we're going to use Express on the back end for routing and middleware. Now for this tutorial, I'm going to be using a dev dependency of TypeScript. In this case, TypeScript is totally optional. You can still follow the tutorial with plain JavaScript. I'm going to be using TypeScript just so I can avoid silly typos and mistakes. But because of that, I'm going to also need to install a couple of types. So I'm going to install types node and types express like this. All right, so with that, we can open it in VS Code. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do in the API folder is I'm going to run npx tsc dash dash init. This will generate a TS config for us. Let's also make a new directory. We'll call it source, and I'm going to touch a new file instead of source. We're going to call this one index.ts. If you're using pure JavaScript, you're going to call this one index.js instead. All right, so let's switch the file, and what we're going to do is we're going to import express from express. I'm going to create a new constant called app, so this will simply invoke express let's have a top level route we'll have a request and response so let's simply do a rest.json of message and the message will be okay like this so let's do app.listen port 3000 and we can pass any closure we're going to console log a url so this will be http localhost on port 3000 like this so what i'm going to do next is i'm going to open up the ts config file and i'm going to switch a few configuration options so i'll change target to es next because i myself am using node so if i do node dash dash version or just node dash v i have node 12 installed so i'm going to be using that and I'm going to also change output directory to dist and the root directory or the source directory is going to be of course source. We're going to also have a source map and I'm going to also tell TypeScript to remove comments when it's creating the build. And that should be it for now. So if I switch back to the terminal, let's do npx tsc. So this will build the TypeScript files for us. And if we do nls, you're going to see a dist directory. Inside of it, we're going to have the index.js file and also index.js.map. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the package.json file inside of the API folder. In here, let's add a script. We're going to call this one build. We're going to have a dev script as well. So the build script, what it's going to do is it's going to simply run a TSC. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to have a pre-build script, and this one will simply remove the disk directory if it already exists. Now for the dev script, if you're using plain JavaScript, you're going to want to install Nodemon. So you can do a dev dependency of Nodemon. But since I'm using TypeScript, I'm going to instead install TS node dev like this. And then for my dev script, I'm going to call TS node dev with the option of transpile only and also no notify. This will simply disable desktop notifications and this will look in the source directory like this. So now if we do npm run dev, this is going to start a dev server so I can open up a new tab. If I do curl on localhost 3000, this will give us a message of okay. Now if I switch back in here and if I go back to index.js or index.ts, if I change the message to works. This should restart the server and if I fire off any request, this will update the message as well. Okay, so that's basically it for the skeleton of the application. What we're going to do next is we're going to move on to session management.